How good is every legendary in Fae? Well, let's rank them all and find out. I ranked every single legendary in Fae to figure out how good is each legendary in each season. I factored in how good they were in Arena, Summoner Duels, and Aether Rings. And while I didn't factor in their scoring, I cared more about how good they were in Arena. And after several months, this is what I came up with. So sit back, buckle up, and get comfy, because we're taking a look at every single legendary in Fire Emblem Heroes. Wind Season is weirdly focused on support, with a lot of legendaries being able to support the team in different ways. It was actually kind of hard to figure out who was the worst win legendary, because with most of them, you're deciding on how much you value a given support effect as a whole. In my mind, this season was proof that just because you support the team, it doesn't automatically make you a good unit, as certain effects become less valuable as power creep changes what we want in this game. Speaking of which, in last place we have... Legendary Hrid. He has a horrible player phase, a horrible enemy phase, and he's also in a horrible archetype. He inflicts guard to the foe with the lowest res, and it splashes to other foes within two spaces. But other than a minor stat swing, I genuinely struggle to understand why I should care about Hrid. Guard itself isn't a bad effect, but it's almost never an effect that makes or breaks the meta, when we have so many other broken debuffs or effects you can apply on your enemy instead. Not to mention that anti-guard and tempo have only become more and more common with the rise of speed def and speed res tempo 4, which infantry just love to use nowadays for access to 50% DR piercing. In this meta where you have special jumping and all of these other crazy ways to accelerate your specials, they're likely pre-charged by the time you face them anyways, and you'd rather prevent specials from going off in the first place with things like scowl, rather than relying on things like guard. And even ignoring that, the biggest issue is that he's a melee cav, a very questionable archetype to be in arena when the maps are filled with trenches that stop cavalry movement. And also, he is a sword cav in a season where there are two other sword calves you can run instead. Not to mention, every other sword cav they've made since 2018. Calling Hrit irrelevant would be putting it nicely. He cannot kill anything, you will die to everything, and other than inflicting guard, Hrit is dead weight in almost every single way. Hrit just sucks, and I guess it's genetic, because then we have his sister. Legendary Gunther is a horrible ranged calf who gives even less support than Hrit. She does absolutely nothing to support her team, and to be honest, she does absolutely nothing at all. Her weapon and preference skill might look like a lot, but it's just a complicated way of saying she gets a stat swing between her and her opponent. I know that Legendary Male Robin taught us that some stats are good, but his degree of stats is so much that you just can't ignore it, whereas Gunther's stat swing isn't really amounting to much of anything. And to be honest, she's only getting worse and worse as they make better ranged calves. Being a ranged calf is one of the most competitive archetypes, and I can't even say that she will be outclassed when she has already been outclassed by nearly hundreds of units. I genuinely had a hard time deciding between Hrid and Gunther on who was the worst, but both of these units are so bad that they aren't even worth the rent space in your head just thinking about it. Who you will pick will depend on if you value Hrid's ability to inflict guard while he's stuck in a bad archetype. Or if you value having a ranged calf that sucks in every single way, but you like ranged calves more than melee ones. Between the two, I think Hrid sucks just a little bit more, but I honestly don't even care when both of these units are so horrible and you absolutely do not want to summon for any of them. Next, we have Legendary Lin. I only put her above Gunthra and Hrid because I like her archetype as a ranged infantry more than I value Hrid as a melee calf. And... Her in-combat feud effect is more unique than anything Gunther could ever do. I'm not saying I love it, but at least it's... something. Otherwise though, Lin also just sucks, and you basically want to replace the entire kit and weapons on all of these guys. She gets a sweep effect against melee units when she outspeeds her opponent by 5, which sounds amazing at first, until you take one look at her speed stat and you realize she's absolutely never ever gonna do that at all. You can have a plus 10 Lin with max dragon flowers and a floret and get 49 speed. For comparison, fallen female Byleth gets 47 speed just out of the box alone, and it's a safe bet that you will not get this sweep off. There's no way she was going to outspeed these monsters before, but especially not now after the speed creep jump that happened in book 7. So her sweep effect is non-existent, and the only other thing she has going for her is the feud effect I mentioned earlier, which is good against, I guess, just fallen Maria. But Maria's already making her way out of the meta, and considering Lin has absolutely nothing else to offer, she cannot do anything, she will die to everything, and you definitely don't want to summon for her either. Then, we have Legendary Micaiah. 
She is one of the worst design units I've ever seen in this game, and it's embarrassing that she finds herself this low in E tier. Her kit makes absolutely no sense. She has a conditional desperation too, where she needs to be under 50% HP, which I personally hate, because unless you're running just Wings of Mercy strategies, you'd almost always prefer your units to have more HP than less. And notice I say she has desperation too, and not the desperation effect, because she really does need to be under 50% HP just to get it, which is worse than the condition for desperation 3. She has a preference assist, but this is one of the most unimpactful assists in the entire game, when all it does is convert penalties into bonuses while healing the ally and lessening Makaya's own HP. I'm guessing that's how you're supposed to get Makaya's desperation too, but even then, she has a weapon designed for player phase, not enemy phase, and she also only gets a guaranteed follow-up when she initiates. And then she has damage reduction only when she initiates or when the foe is ranged, by the way, which is so weird, because if you're already using her at low HP, you're decreasing your chances at surviving anyway, and I highly doubt 30% DR would even matter at that point. You're stuck deciding between whether you want her to attack or use her assist, and it feels like she has to take double the amount of actions just to get anything going, which is not only horrible from an action economy standpoint, but also outright stupid when we've had units that can get like 20 effects and better damage reduction just by breathing. And also, her speed stat is what I call monkey in the middle, where it's so middling that you can't do enough to try to stack it, but it's also not low enough to ignore, and you'd rather have that BST just go to other stats instead. I think Micaiah sucks on a multitude of levels. Infantry mages are already very competitive and arguably questionable. You want to replace her entire kit, and even if you did, her weapon just sucks and makes no sense. I only put her here because maybe you'd want to convert your allies' penalties into bonuses, but the fact that it takes up a whole action makes it so bad, and otherwise, she's outright useless. And, say it with me now, she cannot do anything, she will die to everything, unless she gets a refine that makes her broken. She will stay as one of the worst win legendaries in the entire game. These four units are so horrible that I can't even recommend replacing their kid with arcanes. Do not summon for these guys, and I can't even put them into D tier in good conscience. Into E tier they go. Next, we have Legendary Lucina, aka a glorified swap bot. Some of you might be surprised that I put her this low, and to be honest, I was too at first. Her father is one of the best units in the game with his assist skill, while Lucina's effects from swapping is so underwhelming that it is eclipsed by every other support in the game, and when you think of support units nowadays, absolutely no one is thinking of Legendary Lucina. Her preference assist skill gives her a guaranteed follow-up attack to her and her swapped ally, which is so irrelevant when everyone is running null follow-up. Even if you wanted offensive positioning, you literally have Soaring Guidance or a certain other win legendary, and if you wanted defensive positioning, you have yet another win legendary that can do it better than Lucina ever could. Don't get me wrong, a preference swap can be amazing, it's just that Future Vision 2 isn't. While swap isn't the worst, it's far from the same tier as reposition, and I'd much rather have it do so much more to make up for it. But at least her preference swap is what saved her from E tier, and I don't see her getting any worse, but I really don't see her getting any better. Her support is so useless, and other than just having the ability to run swap in arena, there's absolutely nothing unique that makes Lucina good. I don't know how many times I have to say this, but she cannot kill anything, she will die to everything, and I cannot ever recommend running Legendary Lucina. Next, we have Legendary Sigurd. If you told someone in Book 5 that this Sigurd would be this low, they would call you crazy. This guy definitely broke the meta, he arguably jump-started power creep by several years, we have an entire AR structure because of him, and he's living proof that IS doesn't know how to design their own game. You can actually tell how old he is just by looking at his preference B skill, which is so irrelevant and it feels like it's 7 years old, because it is, but otherwise, he gets a guaranteed follow-up attack and some conditional damage reduction. Sigurd is a great example of how an effect can become so valued in the meta, yet become so devalued later, when we get something even better and easier to use instead. Or in other words, why Guidance is so stupidly broken. Back in Book 5, giving your team plus one movement sounds like the most broken thing on the planet, and that's because it was. At the time, it was the best and such an unprecedented way to increase the threat range of your team, and every additional increase in range makes such an insane difference when the maps are so small. But nowadays, you'd much rather have Guidance support when it not only feels like so much more movement than plus one move, but it's also more flexible and effective. And that's actually why things like extra movement from Legendary Sigurd, T Sigurd, the Azuras, or even Duo Dogger's Pathfinder has fallen off, when all of these effects are only active for one turn. Whereas Guidance is not only active passively all the time, but you also just move so much further. And the bigger issue is that even if you wanted plus one movement, you literally have so many better ways to get it, like from T Sigurd or just anyone else instead. I will say that I actually like him more than other Sword Calves, because he can always move one extra space, and his support is far from useless. Plus, he has the potential to get even better with his future refine. 
but his offenses and defenses just suck, and he will die on anything that sneezes on him. So he's been reduced to a kamikaze unit that will grant plus one movement for one turn before he dies. Even though calves are getting better in the meta, it's a tall order to fix his kit offensively. And defensively, calves are one of the worst archetypes in the game anyways, and I'd much rather run T Sigurd instead, who himself isn't even that meta relevant. I only see Sigurd getting worse and worse as we have better and easier ways to support the team with movement, and as they make more and more sword calves, that's why I put him down here. Both Lucina and Sigurd don't do a lot, and they're not at all good, but at least it's something, which is more than all of the clowns in E tier, and that's why they're going right here. Next, we have Legendary Female Byleth. She neutralizes Guard, because she just hates Frit, I guess, and she also gives herself Null Follow. But the main thing making her unique is her ability to warp around and give her allies drive tempo. But the biggest issue is that she's in one of the most competitive archetypes to be in this game, and I'd honestly rather run someone who's an even better nuke than her, or someone that can give even more support. And as things are right now, she's not really that good at either. She's able to move around quite a bit with her Order's mobility, and if this were a few years ago, I would've put her higher on that alone. But with the stupid insane that is Guidance 4, everyone can move even better than Legendary Female Byleth, and now she doesn't really have a lot going for her. She's only up here due to her unique ability to give Drive Tempo, which is one of, if not the only ways to outsource Tempo to your allies, and how much you value Female Byleth will depend on how much you value Tempo as a whole. I wouldn't call Tempo a bad effect, and it's actually a really good one that can make or break it for many units, but in my opinion, most units who want Tempo already have it in their weapons. The ones who don't want Tempo aren't exactly going to break the meta if they get it, and there's plenty of units that are perfectly fine with not having Tempo anyways. For all of those reasons, I'm not that fond of Female Byleth. I can see the arguments for switching Byleth and Sigurd around if you value plus one movement more than you value Drive Tempo, but I like Byleth slightly more because you have so many other ways to get extra movement, while there's basically no other way to outsource tempo. I don't really see her getting that much worse, assuming she remains the only way to outsource tempo to your allies, but I don't really see her getting better either, as they keep making better infantry nukes that can support. Even though her support is good and unique, it doesn't necessarily make it meta relevant, and that's why I put her down here. Then we have Legendary Elliewood. I know it's crazy you put him this low when he was one of the best supports in the game, but Power Creep has come so far, and he's starting to show his age even after his refine. At the time, his support was one of the best supports in the game, but now we've gotten better support units and units that can contribute to the team in bigger and different ways. He gives map-wide bonus doubler, Null Panic, and Kanto 1 to the ally with the highest attack, which is pretty good, but how much you value Eliwood will depend on how much you value the specific support he gives. I actually think that bonus doubler is just an okay effect now, Nobody would say that getting in combat stats is useless, but you have this one other legendary that can give your team even more stats to multiple allies, and that's not even mentioning that they're both getting worse and worse in the meta, as ploy becomes more and more common. Then, Null Panic isn't horrible, but I don't really like it because it requires your opponent to actively inflict something on you to get any benefit, and otherwise it's doing nothing for you. And I'd rather have effects that not only do more, but I'd also rather be in control of my own buffs and when they activate, rather than needing to rely on my opponent. Though it does have great synergy with Bonus Doubler, and that's definitely why they gave it to him. And lastly, Kanto 1 is amazing, and that's actually why I like him better than Young Eliwood. But there's easier ways to get it as a support, and you can even give it to your whole team, not just one ally. I'm not calling Eliwood a bad support, but compared to the power creep today, it can feel very restrictive and he can only support one ally instead of the whole team, unless you want to coordinate everyone's attack stat. Nowadays, he's become a glorified smite bot that sits around and does nothing because his offenses and his defenses are so horrible, and I'd much rather have a unit that can be so much better offensively and as a support. He was great when raid bosses were at the top of the meta, but now that they've fallen off, his support has become even less relevant. And even when raid bosses do come back into the meta, knowing IS will definitely have more and better units that can give more support than Ellie would over here, and that's why I only see him getting worse and worse. Next, we have Legendary Mer, aka just a sitting source of anti-warping and absolutely nothing else. She gets a follow-up denial and a guaranteed follow-up attack, but the only thing you actually care about is her ability to be Gatekeeper Jr. The biggest issue though is that it takes up her C skill, when you'd much rather have her run Soaring Guidance instead. She did get a little bit better with new skills like Counter Roar, Scowl, and she enjoys the Distant Counter Dragon Seal, but her preference weapon just sucks, and she can't run the best skill that makes Flyer so good. And outside of her anti-warping, she offers absolutely nothing as a support, 
support. She cannot kill anything, and she will die to almost everything. Murr is just a worse flying gatekeeper, because gatekeeper does anti-warping, while also providing so much other effects. And otherwise, Murr is so unimpactful that I struggle to think what to even say about her. Maybe you'd want to run her for a single team comp in SDS, but team slots are the most competitive thing in summoner duels, and I'd much rather just let my opponent warp and slot in literally any other unit that can benefit my team more than Murr. Because otherwise, there is no good reason to run her when you have better flyers, better dragons, and better ways to stop warping. I can see the arguments for swapping Murr and Eliwood, depending on what support you like better. But to be honest, they're both not that good. In my mind, she only edged out Eliwood because she's still the only other way to passively stop warping, other than Gatekeeper. And at least her support is more unique than whatever Eliwood does. But the moment they make a better source of anti-warping, she's going straight into C tier, and I only see her getting worse and worse. All of these guys give supports that are situational at best and outright irrelevant at worst, but at least their support is unique and is enough to feel some tangible impact to the team, and that's why they're going into C tier. Then we have Legendary Veronica. It's crazy how she used to be the absolute best win Legendary, so it's interesting to see just how the mighty have fallen. To me, she's one of the earliest examples of what I call the if unit initiates combat, enemy unit disintegrates immediately, age we found ourselves in today. She gets offensive no follow up, a full desperation effect, and if you somehow didn't die to that, she also gets a freaking sweep effect while also piercing your DR with a 2 cooldown special that she gets down to 1 with her slang. By the end of book 6, how in the world were you supposed to survive that? But the biggest issue for her now is actually the crazy speed creep spike of book 7, and everyone else outspeeding her. She suffered a lot when she relies on her speed to take advantage of her desperation, and having the ability to make a follow up before your opponent can counter attack just doesn't matter if you can't make a follow up at all. Not to mention just how much more common and valuable Null C Disrupt has become, meaning even her sweep effect might not go off. Ultimately, it's getting harder and harder for her to kill things in an age where the newest nukes today simply don't struggle like she does. I will say that she enjoys calves getting better in the meta with skills like Insight, Trace 4, and Flared Mirror. So she's not exactly useless, but as Deer Piercing becomes more common through support, skills, other preference specials, and even specials you can inherit, her preference special isn't really making her unique anymore. She's just a ranged nuke with no support, and she's certainly not a bad one at all. But as they keep making better ranged nukes, one of the most popular archetypes in the game, she's only getting worse and worse, and that's why I put her down here. Then we have Legendary Female Corrin. She was definitely one of the worst units in the game and worst win legendaries before her refine, due to her archetype and inability to do, well, uh, anything. But now, she has special acceleration on crack, special cooldown charge plus one per attack, flat DR, 7 HP healing, she nullifies guard because she also hates Frid, she gets true damage, and she has 40% non-pierceable DR from her special. She's built around tanking, looping, and retaliating with her negating fang, a pretty great preference special. And as a unit, I actually like her quite a bit. If you wanted an infantry tank, I would argue she's one of, if not the very best at it. And outside of maybe just sweep effects, you'd better hope to outspeed her or decelerate her special somehow, or else you're stuck fighting this monster you just can't kill. But I do have some serious doubts about her archetype as a whole and how much value you'd really get from running an infantry tank. And that's actually why I put her here. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't call her a bad unit, but in such a crazy player phase meta, infantry tanks and arguably tanks in general are just not that valuable of a role when everyone dies to everything. It's a big ask to warrant carrying tanks around, and that's kind of why she's awkward in the meta. And you might not want to run Corrin based on her archetype alone. I was debating whether or not she's better than Veronica, and it honestly depends on who you value more. Do you value a unit who's outclassed in a given role, but the role itself is very useful? Or do you value someone who's amazing at the role, but the role itself isn't really that good? In the end, I liked Corrin just a little bit more, because if one day Omni tanks rise back up in the meta, then you have your Corrin as an amazing option ready to go. She's the best at what she does, which you'd enjoy in case her role becomes more valuable in the potential future, as opposed to Veronica, who's already been outclassed as a mage calf that pierces damage reduction. And that's why I put her down here. Both of these units are very usable and useful today, but Veronica's showing her age while only getting worse, and Corrin is a defensive tank trapped in a crazy player face meta, so I can't put these guys any higher than B tier. Next, we have Legendary Yuri. With his plus one movement, he has the threat range of a ranged cavalry unit while suffering none of the downsides because he's an infantry unit while also having access to all the amazing skills infantry can use. It's interesting that on release, you'd have a hard time arguing Yuri was better than Veronica, but as Speed Creep took her down, his staying power actually comes from his preference positional assist, Foul Play, a three space swap which is Loki insane and you can only get it from this Yuri in Arena if you care about your scoring. And also, he's only gotten better since he came out with skills like Speed Def 
Up Tempo 4 and Disarm Trap 4. But the biggest issue is his offensive power and his role as a hit and run unit, as he's been outclassed in both, and he will only continue to be outclassed as power creep gets crazier and crazier. I still think he's a great AoE nuker option, since he has offensive no follow up, and most importantly, true damage even with AoE specials. But he's getting outclassed there too, and it's made even worse that his preference skill is in his C slot, meaning he can't even run Times Pulse or Pulse Up Blades. And other than neutralizing Stall, which is only relevant in Summoner Duels, I can't recommend him as the best hit and run or AoE nuker. That being said, I'm actually valuing him more as a support unit. He will always be valuable with Foul Play, which gives him amazing offensive and defensive positioning support. Not to mention his Kanto 2, which makes him amazing at moving both him and his teammates away from danger. Having both Foul Play and Kanto 2 makes playing with Yuri and using him to move your teammates one of the most versatile, effective, and creative things you can do in this game. While the Kroms can emulate something similar, nobody does defensive positioning better than Yuri, and that alone makes him amazing. While he's in A tier now, I can see him moving down a bit as his kill power is only getting worse and worse. But I don't think he'll truly be legendary crit bad due to how useful and unique foul play is, and that's why I put him here. Yuri is an amazing unit, and foul play will keep him useful for quite a while, but he doesn't really break the meta or win season, and that's why he goes in A tier. Now, in S tier, we have no one, because this unit is so insanely good that putting them in just one tier above Yuri cannot explain how good they are. I don't understand why the power levels between the best and worst win legendaries are so absurd. This unit is so insanely broken, they stand alone in their own tier as not only the best win legendary, but one of the best units in the entire game. In S plus tier, we have... Legendary Alincia. She's one of the best units to come out of Book 7, and she's arguably the best flyer in the game in an age where flyers are the best unit type. I struggled to mention exactly what she can do, when it would be easier to mention what she can't do. She has the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase. She neutralizes Guard as some sick joke just to put Hrid even further into the grave. She comes with Kanto too, because why not just give it to her? She grants herself and her allies full no follow-up regardless of the unit type, and most importantly, she comes with the most broken skill in the game, Guidance 5. What were they thinking? She can warp all of your units, even the calves and armors, and gives them insane mobility so good that it makes T-Sigurd look like a joke, and it's outright embarrassing for skills like Rain Snap, Grey Waves, or any other unit that tries to support the team with mobility, knowing they just can't do it as well as Legendary Alincia. She has the best offensive positioning in the game when she lets ranged units kill you from 6 tiles away, and she can take care of defensive positioning all by herself when she can rally or reposition someone and get away with Kanto 2. How well she'll age will depend on how IS handles anti-warping in the meta. But I'm actually not that big of a fan of the Grass Divine Vein or Ratatouille, because she has to move and actually commit to attacking something just to get anything up. And unless you're running just Gatekeeper, you're forced to waste actions or skills to actively combat her warping. And that's things you could have allocated to other buffs and effects. Whereas Alincia and every other flyer passively enables their warping because they weren't going to run anything else in their C slot anyways. I can see how warping got hurt in AR, but you already have so many other options in AR anyways. And the real issue is that warping is still as prevalent as ever in Arena, Summoner Duels, and basically every other mode. And in Arena specifically, Ratatouille doesn't even matter because you're always going to use Alencia on your player face and you can kill Ratatouille and take advantage of your warping before she can even move or blink. Unless they make a duo Summer Gatekeeper with the most broken anti-warping effects, or until they make anti-warping an effect that doesn't take up a lot of space in the skill economy, I really don't see warping being that hard countered in the meta. And even if she ages, she's still a source of no follow-up and a flying brave attacker that can pierce damage reduction and even run other C skills like Deadly Miasma. I genuinely wonder what in the world were they thinking when sometimes they make legendary Guinevere, and sometimes they do this, and I will eat my words the day Alencia becomes as bad as legendary Hrid. But until then, Legendary Alencia is and will be the absolute best win legendary and one of the most impactful units they've ever put in this game. Alencia stands alone in S plus tier as the queen of win season and it's not even close. I don't think it's any dispute that she's currently the best win legendary in the game. And with that, all of the win legendaries have been ranked, so let's check out the fire legendaries.
fire season has so many bad units, maybe even more than wind season, except most of them don't even support the team, so they end up aging relatively poorly. There's only a few fire legendaries I would even consider using, and the rest are units that I really, really don't want. Speaking of which, in last place we have Legendary Roy. You would have to pay me just to willingly use this guy. It's actually just sad knowing he was definitely the worst fire legendary before his refine, and unfortunately, he's definitely the worst fire legendary even after it. He has distant counter, some special charging, null guard, and some damage reduction, all of which I just don't care about. And then he can give a tiny bit of support to his team, but I bet you might not have known that because his support sucks. He can give his team plus 6 to attack and speed, but plus 6 is so irrelevant nowadays and it's such a waste of space in his skill economy when I'd rather have him do literally anything else but that. And also, he can only support the team if there's no dragon or beast units. It's not a huge deal considering most of them suck anyways, but it's just outright stupid when nearly every other unit today can support their allies just by sitting there. I personally hate restrictions on how you give out your support effects, like only giving it to a support partner or allies with a certain condition. When you have some units just giving out the most broken support in the game to literally anyone within two spaces, and their only requirement is to breathe. It's so weird that he has a restriction on such an irrelevant support, and I really cannot think of a single reason I'd run Roy when there are better infantry swords, better melee infantries, better swords in general, and definitely better omni tanks. There are nearly a hundred other infantry swords in this game that you could run instead of this Roy. And being a sword infantry is the absolute most competitive archetype to be in. So much so that even if you made this Roy the literal best you could, there are at least 10 more god swords that could do his job better right out of the box. In terms of an aging standpoint, infantry swords are the most common archetype in Fae, and they just can't stop making newer ones. There's also only so many different ways you could design a melee infantry, so from a competition and from a game design standpoint, it is the role the absolute most prone to being outclassed because of the sheer frequency of newer options. And to make things even worse, being a melee infantry is just a bad archetype to be right now. His distant counter is irrelevant when he will die to anything and he won't live long enough to counter anything at a distance. His damage reduction is becoming so irrelevant when DR piercing is so common. And I don't even care that he's effective against dragons when he's only effective at dragging the team down. He's not a good support. He's not good on enemy face, he's not good on player face, and he's definitely not a good fire legendary. But at least he can't get any worse when he is already the worst fire legendary in the entire game. Then we have yet another infantry sword, Legendary Marth. He's one of the few units that comes with both a preference special and a preference skill, when nearly every other unit comes with just one preference skill, special, or assist. You'd think that would make him amazing, and while he was pretty cool at the time, there's really no reason to run him or arguably infantry swords as a whole. If he outspeeds his opponent by 5, or they're a dragon unit, he gets follow-up denial, a guaranteed follow-up, and a sweep effect. But his speed stat is just not good, meaning his B skill is practically useless, and it will basically never activate against non-dragons that aren't slower than ketchup. He does get a lot of stats with his weapon, and it's certainly not bad but it's just not as good as this one other legendary and you'd rather have unique and more impactful effects in your weapon and on a unit, rather than just stats that start to matter less and less. And finally, he's got a 2 cooldown preference special that deals some extra damage that technically supports the team, but it only gives plus 6 stats to the team after Marth's combat, which is just an irrelevant support, and it reminds me of a certain other bad fire legendary. His support is not good, his offenses are not good, his defenses are not good, and his archetype is not good. Maybe he can be used as a dragon killer with his dragon effectiveness, but most dragons aren't even relevant in the meta. You probably won't even see any dragons to defeat, and I highly doubt Marth can even take out the very few dragons he actually runs into. He's the type of unit that looks amazing on paper, but he's actually really bad in practice today. And I promise you, there are definitely other infantry swords you'd much rather run instead. He cannot do anything, he will die to everything, and you definitely don't want to run legendary Marth. Then we have Legendary Ephraim. This guy is not at all good, but he's only here because he's a melee calf, which is better than being a melee infantry. Well, uh, I don't know if better is the right word. It is less worse than being a melee infantry. He nullifies guard, gets 10 HP healing, some special charging, and a guaranteed follow-up, all of which are just meh effects at best, and outright irrelevant at worst. And he also can't survive anything because he has no damage reduction, or really, any form of defenses at all. There is absolutely nothing making Ephraim uniquely useful, or even unique. He cannot do anything, 
He will die to everything, and you're better off just replacing his entire kit with arcanes. But even if you did, being a melee cav is just so annoying in Arena. It's such a hassle to get him and other calves around with all the trenches, and he also does nothing to support the team. So I cannot think of a single reason you'd want to run this guy. I can see the arguments for swapping Ephraim and Marth depending on what you value more and what you plan to do with him. Marth has both his preference special and his beast skill, which is more unique and usable than basically all of Ephraim's kit. But if you're going to be replacing both of their kits at max investment, then with how much better calves have gotten in the meta, with skills like Flared Sparrow and Alarm, Marth might be better in theory, but Ephraim might actually be better in practice, and that's why I put Ephraim here. But it doesn't really matter, because both of these units just suck. They're only getting worse and worse as time goes on, and I only really like Ephraim slightly more because he's a melee calf. Speaking of melee calves, we have Legendary Xander. We finally got him so many years after we got Ryoma, and as a reward for our patience, they made him one of the worst fire legendaries they've ever made. What were they cooking? Intelligent Systems must have known he was bad, and so they put him in the historical worst selling time slot of the year. And his banner remains one of the worst selling banners of all time in the history of the game, even worse than Legendary Guinevere. For a long time, we hadn't gotten any good axe calves, and for some weird reason, they decided to overcompensate, because then we got so many great axe calves back to back. They tried to sell us a fourth axe calf unit in a row, and his name was Legendary Xander. He's definitely not the best Axe Cav now, and to be honest, he wasn't the best Axe Cav even on his release. Back in Book 6, I definitely would have preferred to have Groom Roy or even Summer Dimitri over Xander. I can't tell if he's supposed to be designed as some mixed phase melee Cav, or he's just a really underwhelming player phase Cav, but it just doesn't matter when there's this one unit that's better than Xander in literally every single possible way. If you are unlucky enough to get a legendary Xander, the sad part is that he's not even good fodder, and his only saving grace is being able to give out Sea Feud just to take out this one little sister who used to rock the meta. No Xander, not that one! He gets null follow-up, some special charging, and some 7 HP healing, all of which I really don't care about, and he gets 50% damage reduction at best, which matters less and less when DR piercing is becoming so common. And it's also just depressing, knowing that if anybody needs damage reduction, it's Xander, because him and Cavs in general are just really bad defensively. And he comes with Kanto remaining plus one, meaning Xander has even worse Kanto than Ephraim. Still, I like his kit slightly more, or well, like is a strong word. The point is that he sucks slightly less than Ephraim, and that's why I put him here. Don't even touch these guys. All four of them are wasting space on your team and they suck even if you replaced their whole kit with arcanes. These are the worst fire legendaries in the game and it's no surprise they make their way into E tier. Then we have legendary Hector. The only reason why he's here and not in E tier is because he's an armor, meaning he can run a safe skill and he can shield your team from a single hit before he peacefully passes away. That's all. It's not a lot, and he's definitely not good. But being a large sack of potatoes is a more meaningful contribution to the team than all of these guys combined. Although you'll have to give him a save skill because instead, he comes with one of the worst preference specials in the game, a very, very awkwardly limiting special pulse to your team, which you can't just give to your allies unconditionally, you actually have to meet the tactics requirement. And it's just pathetic when in comparison, you have countless other better ways to give special cooldown support to your allies. And also, his weapon just sucks, with damage reduction that will easily be pierced, and a follow-up denial, which I just don't care about when everyone and their dog has null follow-up. Follow-up denial is probably the most useless effect in the game when everyone has offensive null follow-up, a brave attack, or both. And the worst part is that he's green, one of the worst colors to be as a tank when we've been surrounded by so many green nukes for literal years at this point. And this was the moment I had to ask, why would I run Legendary Hector? He's definitely not useful today. Outside of the ability to just use near or far save once before he dies, he's not unique in the slightest because you definitely don't want to run his weapon or his preference C skill. And actually, having Ostia's pulse in the C skill makes things even worse because it's competing for the same slot as saves or assault troop if you wanted to make him a player face armor. Not that you should, I actually beg you please do not do that, and in that sense, Hector might actually be worse than Roy. But just having the ability to run a save is why I put him here, and he's most definitely not getting any better, but at least he's not getting any worse, because just like Roy, I don't think Hector can get any worse when he is already one of the worst armors in the entire game. This green armored fire legendary sucks, but at least there's no other. 
Everything I said about Hector also applies to legendary Edelgard, but I only put her above him because at least she's uniquely designed to player face, uh, sorta. Like she's definitely not good at all, and she's only getting worse, but at least she can hit hard uh, sometimes. But otherwise, Legendary Edelgard is one of the absolute worst design units in the game. There's a reason why nearly every armor is forced to be a save unit. Not only is it one of the best things a unit can do to contribute to the team, but it's also just so much better than literally anything else armors could possibly do. When you are an armored unit, what exactly are you trading in exchange for a lack of mobility, one of the most important aspects in all of Fire Emblem? And the answer is, uh, nothing. Nowadays, skills and units give everyone so much bulk and so many effects that it makes a world of difference more than a bit of BST ever could. And that's why player phase armors are forced to either cheat like crazy to the point they don't even move like armors, or they're not good units, just like legendary Edelgard. And why would I use her when I can literally use any of these other options that are better than her in every single way? She does get some nice things like true damage, special charging, and damage reduction. And then she gets some things that are borderline useless, like follow-up denial and a guaranteed follow-up attack. And of course, being Edelgard means you get an extra action. But what I don't understand is, why is her weapon designed for enemy face, while her preference beast skill is designed for player face? She only gets most of her effects when she's solo, which I hate with the passion of a thousand burning suns, because she moves like ketchup on a plate, and it feels like you need to move your own allies out of her way, rather than moving her away from your allies, because she just can't get around. She did get a little bit better with Guidance 4, but there's a reason why we'd much rather run Soaring Guidance instead. Having your armors be able to jump so far like that is a lot better than having them not do that at all, and it was pretty great when we only had Guidance 4, but Flyers are significantly better options both as player phase nukes and as frontliners, and using your armors to attack with Guidance 4 is just a niche novelty today that you don't even really use because it means giving up your save unit. Honestly, I'd rather have Legendary Edelgard be a save than whatever she's trying to do in her own player phase, but then you actually don't want to use her preference weapon or beast skill because you would get less effects when her kit actually wants her to be solo, and at that point she might actually be worse than Hector. The only thing unique about her is how she sucks in such a unique way. Her refined was not good, and she really would have liked a lot more than this. She doesn't support the team, and she actually hurts your own team when you gotta move everyone else away from her. She's not a good player phase armor, she's not a good enemy phase armor, Armor, and she's definitely not a good fire legendary. And she will remain one of the worst fire legendaries even after her refine. Both Hector and Edelgard are not good, and you definitely don't want them, but at least they can take a single hit before they die, which is a more meaningful contribution than the absolute worst melee infantries and calves. And that's why they're going right here. Next, we have Legendary Celica. She's definitely far from one of the worst infantry mages in the game. And she's actually a somewhat decent one, but I'm not that fond of ranged infantries in general, and it's hard to recommend her when there are countless better options that can nuke better and provide better support than Celica. Her kit is actually not that bad. She gets some true damage even with AoEs, some special charging, and a times pulse effect in her weapon. But the thing that makes her stand out the most to me is her preference B skill, which is like a magical null follow-up combined with an unconditional desperation effect. While I think her preference B is pretty good, I'd argue that with the amount of power creep today, you now want preference skills that are not only unique, but they also have things that are rare or even unseen in this game, rather than effects that you can just outsource elsewhere. And even ignoring that, her speed stat is not that good anyways, meaning it will almost never matter if you have desperation anyways, if you can't make a follow-up attack in the first place. So at that point, her B skill is just magical no follow-up, which itself isn't even the best skill infantries want to run in their B slot. And I think she actually got worse when Firestorm Dance 3 came out, and when magical no follow-up became so much more common, since it's on Brave Soren, one of the most easily accessible and most common unit types in the game, meaning now you can easily emulate legendary cell with nearly anyone, including Brave Soren himself. And ultimately, she's really not that unique anymore. I can see the arguments for putting her higher if you like the fact that she feels like she's combining two B skill effects in one. But in an age where units are getting seven effects in the weapon alone, and even three more effects in the special, more and more things are getting jammed into every possible area of a kit, and it's now actually the expectation, not the exception, to have several valuable effects put into multiple parts of your kit. Nowadays, 
Celica is not really unique in that aspect when she only has two effects in her preference B skill. And her weapon is quite good, but nothing meta breaking. Being a mage infantry specifically is one of the most competitive archetypes in this game. And while she definitely got a great refine, she doesn't do anything to support the team and she's only getting worse and worse as her effects are easily emulated on other units. And as they make better mage nukers and better mage infantries, you probably don't want to run legendary Celica. Then we have legendary Eitri. Everything I said about wanting to have preference skills that include effects that are rare or unseen in this game, instead of effects that you can get or outsource elsewhere, apply to Eitri as well. Because unfortunately for her, she has a preference B skill that might have been cool at the time, but nowadays, it's just the worst Walmart brand of Brash Assault 4, which itself isn't even the best B skill you want on every ranged flyer. Even if you gave Brash Assault 4 to Eitri, I kind of doubt she would live long enough to get the chance to reflect anything and you're gonna need a lot more than just 30% DR to survive these crazy monster units of today. Not to mention that her DR is only on the first attack as well, so don't even think about sending her against any brave attackers. And then her weapon is somehow even more pathetic than her B skill when it only gives her a guaranteed follow-up attack, which again, who cares when we can swim in no follow-up. And it also only gives her Kanto from turns one through four, which is just stupid. The weirdest part is that she wouldn't even really be that broken even if she came with permanent Kanto, but at least it's Kanto 2 on a ranged unit, which I actually like quite a bit in an age where most flying nukes today are only getting Kanto 1. Ultimately, the only reason Eitri is up here is her ability to be a sitting duck that can run guidance support and maybe rally an ally if you're feeling a little quirky. I do value the ability to run guidance quite a bit, and that's the only reason why she's this high. I consider it to be more useful than everything Celica can do, and just like Hector and Edelgard, there's absolutely nothing that makes her good beyond Eitri just being in her archetype. But if you're less fond of flyers than I am, or if you think guidance support should be valued the same as the ability to be a save, then I can see the arguments for putting her down in D tier next to Edelgard and Hector, because it doesn't matter that she has flying mobility or Kanto if she will die to anything that she initiates on, or she will die to anything that initiates on her. She cannot do anything, she will die to everything, and I definitely do not want to summon for Eitri over any ranged flyer, or really any flyer at all. I can't recommend Celica or Eitri to anyone, but Celica's far from being the worst infantry mage, and Eitri can run Soaring Guidance. It's really not a lot, but at least it's something, and that's why they're going into C tier. Next, we have no one. It's actually embarrassing just how bad these fire legendaries are compared to everyone else. But finally, we have gotten to units that are actually good. Beyond B tier, the rest of these units are the only fire legendaries that I would even consider using. At the bottom of A tier, we have Legendary Female Chess. While I still don't love ranged infantries, it's hard to say no to her when she hits as hard as she does. And in my mind, every time I look at any ranged infantry nuke, I'm comparing them to Legendary Female Chess. She's one of the most powerful units in the game when she has both special charging and the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase. And also, she's effective against basically every single unit type. Just imagine showing this to anyone back in book one. By this point, we already had some really strong player phase units like Legendary Veronica, but this Chez was another piece of the pie that really started to solidify the crazy player phase meta that we've been living in for years now. And she's definitely the reason why we don't have Roker Sieges anymore. Somehow, she has actually gotten even better since she came out, which is crazy just to even think about. She doesn't come with slang, which was a notable issue for her on release, but it doesn't really matter now when you can give her Rally Spectrum, or you can just give her slang yourself if you equip her with the Marth Engage Ring. And also, she's gotten even better with skills like Speed Preempt, Desperation 4, Attack Speed Pledge, and Physical Null Follow-Up, which itself we actually don't even want to run since she has something even better, Speed Death Tempo 4. While she was missing things like Null Follow-Up and DR Piercing, I would argue she became even more valuable when it has never been easier to outsource those effects to her. And that's not even mentioning that she's blue, which helps her against a certain Jolly Three Houses save unit. The only reason why she's this low is that tanks are inevitably getting stronger and stronger. And while she's still a great nuke today, she's actually getting worse and worse as speed creep gets crazier, meaning she will only continue to struggle more to quad and nuke. And even ignoring that, they will inevitably make a stronger nuke than her anyways, which is crazy to think about when this is a unit with effectiveness against all weapon types. We have reached the point where even that is far from the most cancerous effect a unit can have. And to make things even worse, she doesn't support the team at all. Meaning even if you assume she'd instantly delete every unit she initiates on, at best, she's a ranged nuke that can move two spaces. And she's certainly a great one, but I'd rather have units that can contribute to the team in more ways than one. 
and just do more overall. All of the units above her have a similar, if not better, offensive presence while also having a significantly greater supportive presence and that's why I put her down here. Then we have Legendary Female Alir. I know it's a hot take to put her this low, but I'm trying to look at units in the long term, like really far into the future, and yet even today, she's already showing her age a bit. First, I think it'd be easier to talk about the things that are undeniably good. She has, and say it with me now, the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase. Then she gets some extra damage from her special being boosted by her own speed, which is amazing when she's one of the fastest units we've ever gotten in this game. She's definitely worthy of A tier, but other than that, I would argue she struggles defensively with the effects or lack thereof in the rest of her kit, which is a big problem for her when her best use case is as an Omni Tank. She gets some damage reduction from her weapon and her special, which definitely isn't bad, but it's not enough when basically everyone nowadays comes with DR Piercing. And speaking of which, she grants herself and her support partner DR Piercing when they trigger their specials. And at the time, this was ridiculous. Beyond just a few niche skills, most of which were only locked to infantry by the way, there was absolutely no way for most units to pierce damage reduction, when everyone and their dog had multiple sources of DR layered on top of each other like lasagna. But now, when we have so many sources of DR piercing, whether it be from built-in new specials, weapons, preference skills, from other skills or specials you can inherit, or even just giving it to literally anyone at the start of turn, I kind of hate that Alir can only give her DR piercing support to one person at a time. For all of those reasons, I really don't like support effects that are this restrictive, like I mentioned with Roy. But as if this still wasn't bad enough, even if you assume Alir is the best Omni tank in the game, and by the way, she's not, you have to ask yourself if you even want an Omni tank in the first place. When you would rather use archetypes and roles that are more effective and more specialized, Omni tanks have fallen out of the meta. And it's really hard to be an Omni tank when it's hard just to be a normal tank because player phase nukes are so common and so broken. Let's be generous and assume she instantly deletes everyone she initiates on. The real questions I'm asking are, how good is her defense? Will she survive the crazy nukes today, even if the best far savior can't? With all this out of combat damage running around, I really don't think so. Not to mention she's a melee infantry, meaning her threat range just really isn't the best, and she suffers from everything I mentioned with both Legendary Marth and Roy. Omni tanks and melee infantries are some of the most common archetypes that get power crept, and I'd honestly rather run someone who has a bigger threat range or someone that can do more. Her only saving grace then is what she can do as a support, and even there, she's not the best. I can see the value of stacking DR, meaning you have it in both your skills and your specials, but with how restrictive Alir's support is, I see it more as a niche trick you can do, rather than something I would willingly and consistently give up an entire team slot for the single most competitive thing in this game. In this sense, I think she'll age really poorly just like Legendary Male Violet. They both gave an effect that was essential at the time, but they were valuable because they were the only way to give out such an effect, not because they were the best way. And just like Legendary Male Violet, I only see her getting worse and worse as she'll probably be reduced to a bench warmer that can be pretty solid on player phase, but she can't really do anything else. She's not the best Omni tank, she's not the best DR support, She's not the best offensively, and she's definitely not the best defensively. For my money, that's why Legendary Female Alir is the most overrated Fire Legendary. Both Alir and Shez are amazing units, but in an age where everyone is so broken on their player face, they're not really that unique. They're only getting worse and worse, and I'd rather run Camilla instead of Alir for DR support. I can't put them any higher than A tier. And now, we are looking at the absolute best Fire Legendaries in the game. To be honest, these are the only fire legendaries I want to use. And at the bottom of S tier, we have Legendary Lelina. I know it's crazy to put her this high, and I promise you, I originally put her in A tier at first, but the more I thought about it, I struggled to find reasons why she shouldn't be here. Her weapon gives her a guaranteed follow-up attack, 30% DR, and most importantly, slaying, times pulse, and true damage even with an AoE, which by the way, she definitely will be using since she needs absolutely no help to charge one of the best specials in the game, a 2 cooldown AoE with the best layout in the game that also gives one of the best effects in the game, Kanto 1 to her and her whole team. And because of the effects in her weapon, she can keep looping and launching AoEs completely on her own, basically every single time she initiates. Not only is she completely self-sufficient, but she does a better job at granting Kanto 1 better than Ellie would ever could, and she grants Kanto even after she dies, which is actually just ridiculous. And as a support effect, I just love Kanto when I have it, and I absolutely hate Kanto when my opponent has it, 
because Kanto feels like a pseudo reposition or dance. It's one of the best effects in the game because it provides you key defensive or offensive positioning after you've already acted, which makes such a huge difference when a single tile is more than enough to get your buffs going or to be out of danger. And in Arena specifically, I would call Kanto almost mandatory because you can't run reposition if you want to score, and you really need some form of defensive positioning, or else your units are sitting ducks ready to get hit after they initiate. And her kit is so good when AoEs are so powerful, but they're balanced by a high cooldown, and nearly every other unit needs some external support, unless you're legendary Lelina, when you have the best AoE layout in the game while also having it to two cooldown at most. AoEs are definitely one of the best specials in the game because it feels like it disrupts the turn order of player phase and enemy phase. They're so broken for a similar reason why the pre-combat damage is also so broken, but AoEs in particular are so good because it feels like cheating when you can deal damage to multiple enemies all at once and so many units become crippled and useless when their entire kit requires them to be above 25% HP. And it feels like you've eliminated multiple threats at once when you have turned multiple enemy units into a useless potato sacks with 1 HP that deals 0 damage, and they will die to literally anything, and they will die even if they attack you, because they will die on your counterattack. Even with just the Kanto and AoE thing, I would still put her above female Alir, but in my mind, what really solidifies her placement in S tier is the fact that she is basically the only unit in the game that comes with one of the most influential effects in the game, Hardy Bearing, built right into her weapon. Hardy Bearing is consistently regarded as one of the craziest things they could ever put as an echo skill. It is consistently one of the most effective and sometimes only way to take out some of the best and most annoying units in the game, basically anyone with vantage or desperation. And Lelina is basically the only way to get Hardy Bearing other than running it as a seal, which you can only give to one unit at a time. They didn't even give it to her bride version. And other than some irrelevant seasonal units that should be dancing instead of attacking anyways, and an inheritable dagger that absolutely absolutely nobody uses, Lelina is the only way to have Hardy Bearing, and as they make more units with Vantage, Desperation, or as the need for Hardy Bearing becomes more frequent, I simply cannot put her any lower than this. If you're still having doubts about me putting Lelina this high, then let me ask you this. Will they make another powerful ranged nuke? Yeah, they probably will. Will they make another more powerful and bulkier Omni Tank? Yeah, they probably will. But will they make another AoE cab nuker that grants Kanto 1 that also has Hardy Bearing? I don't really know about that one. Not only is she an amazing support, but she's an amazing offensive unit, and she certainly leagues better than every other Fire Legendary. She's definitely the best AoE nuker that provides Kanto, because she's the only AoE nuker that provides Kanto, while she's facing stiff competition from this one other Red Mage cab that can actually pierce DR. And even with all of her competition and downsides, there's just no way I could put her any lower than this when she's easily one of the best Fire Legendaries in the game. But she's not the best Fire Legendary in the game. There's this one unit that not only terrorized Fire Season, but from the moment they came out, they terrorized every single mode in the game. I present to you the most broken Fire Legendary and one of the dumbest units they've ever put in this game. We have Legendary Hinoka. She shaped every single mode in her own image when she single-handedly recreated flyer lines, or what I like to call them, cav lines that move in the air with better mobility than every cav could possibly dream of. She has slang, offensive no follow-up, and canto 1, because why not? She's effective against flying and armored units, because why not? She does true damage even with AoEs. She debuffs nearly the entire team just for fun. She grants special charging to herself and her allies. She has a sweep effect if you are slow or green, and she grants one of the best effects in the game, charge, the equivalent to extra movement with none of the terrain downsides to herself and anyone else that can fly. Who cares about trenches, forests, or even mountains when you have charge or you're a flyer? And in this day and age, you better hope you're a flyer because it feels like every single map in Arena and Summoner Duels is flyer favored. There is no other unit that is more freely mobile than flyers, and I don't need to explain why giving what is essentially one extra movement is so good, especially when you're giving it to a movement type that will never be hindered by anything, meaning there's absolutely nothing stopping them from hitting you with a swarm of dead eyes and flared sparrows. Throughout Book 7, flyers are slowly getting better and better with skills like Guidance 4 and Guard Bearing 4. But then Hinoka put Flyers into maximum overdrive, and Flyers ruled over Book 7 because of her. And I would argue they still rule over Fey even now, and I don't really know when they would stop. I said how I value legendaries that give support, because they end up aging the best. And it's true when she can give your entire Flyer team some of the most insane movement possible. 
Literally no other fire legendary, or arguably even legendaries in general, enable such a powerful and almost essential archetype like this. She enabled flyer lines and this age of flyers for all the same reasons why calves used to be so dominant. Mobility and range is simply the best asset you can have in Fire Emblem, and every role is supposed to be balanced by the fact that they have pros and cons. In fact, I would argue flyers used to be some of the worst archetypes in the game because they didn't have anything they were particularly good at. Armors being able to save is one of the best things you can have in this game, and they used to be nearly mandatory on every team. And then compared to infantries, flyers had really poor skill accessibility, meaning they just couldn't run good things in their kit compared to everyone else. When infantries were better offensively and defensively, and they had the same threat range, why would I run a flyer? And then compared to calves, they don't reach as far as calves do. But with Hinoka and all of these other crazy skills making Flyer so good, it actually disrupts the meaning of each archetype. And I would argue Hinoka and every other Flyer killed the infantry archetype and is actually why infantries have become less relevant. In fact, depending on who you ask, they killed other archetypes too. Hinoka and Flyers are so good that you would commonly see teams of nothing but Flyers and Summoner Duels, meaning you'd rather run yet another Flyer than a save unit. Let that sink in, because that's how powerful Legendary Hinoka is. She's a great debuffer, she's an amazing range nuke, she's a support so good she rebirthed an entire archetype better than anything else we had, and as the cherry on top, she's also ranged. Being an amazing offensive threat and one of the best supports in the game is the equivalent of having your cake and eating it too, especially since Roy can't do either of those things, and really, neither can any of the fire legendaries beyond S tier. Like, what even is this? It is beyond a doubt that Hinoka is not only one of the most meta-impactful fire legendaries they've ever added, but one of the most meta-impactful characters in the game. No other character enables such a powerful support while also being an amazing unit themselves, not even Lelina. And being able to not only serve multiple functions, but to do them all so well is what makes these units so good. Power creep has come to the point where it's no longer enough for you to be really good at one singular thing. And there's even cases where being the best at it just doesn't matter that much, like being the best nuker. You want and basically need units to play multiple roles and do multiple things so ubiquitously well that you are basically the only viable option or choice to run it in this game. And well, look no further than Legendary Hinoka, when she lets all of your flying units become gods. It's no surprise that she's one of the most meta-impactful units they've ever added, and she's definitely the best fire legendary in the entire game. Lelina is one of the most powerful and useful units they've ever made, while Hinoka is one of the most broken units they've ever made, and they stand alone in their own tier, and they rule over Fire Season for good reason. And with that, all of the Fire Legendaries have been ranked, so let's check out the Water Legendaries. Water season used to be known as one of the hardest seasons in Arena, and depending on who you ask, it might still be one of the hardest ones today. There aren't any legendaries in E tier this time around, so you could consider it one of the more balanced seasons. But when you take a look at some of the most broken legendaries, balanced might not be the right word, because the monsters in S tier are just so much better than some of the worst water legendaries in the game. Speaking of which, in last place, we have Legendary Fjorm, aka the Forging Bonds Menace herself. She has Distant Counter, Penalty Neutralization, Conditional Damage Reflection, and uh, oh, oh, that's it. She has three effects when we look at both her weapon and her special, and that's with the Refine, by the way. And for comparison, Winter Violet's special alone is better than all of Legendary Fjorm's kit combined. Her damage reduction from Ice Mirror 2 is actually just sad, because not only does she need to somehow activate her two cooldown special when she has no slang in her weapon, but she also only gets a damage reduction if the foe is ranged, which is pathetic when nowadays you can get better DR just by existing. It also suggests that you're supposed to use Fjorm like a ranged tank, but with how crazy nukes are today, you're never gonna live anything. Her kit is so horrible that you'd rather replace her kit entirely and give her arcanes, but even then, you'd be stuck in Dragonflower debt if you want her BST to match anyone else today. Not to mention, she's a melee infantry, which is one of the worst archetypes to be in. Every day that passes is a day that Fjorm gets worse and worse, and the only thing unique about her is how much she sucks. Then, we have Legendary Erika. 
She has Kanto too, which sounds super nice, but she might as well have Kanto 18, because the amount of spaces you can Kanto just doesn't matter when you can't deal damage to anything. She also gets special cooldown charge plus one per attack, speed based damage reduction, offensive no follow up, and some true damage, but the bigger issue is that she doesn't support the team at all, and she's also a calf, which is one of the worst unit types to be in arena, because all of the maps are designed to be as annoying as possible for calves to traverse. Being a melee cav is already a questionable archetype to be in, but even if you wanted a melee cav, I promise you that this Erica is one of the last ones you'd willingly run, and I can think of at least one other red sword cav I'd rather run instead. She doesn't do anything unique that you can't get from other skills, and she doesn't support her team at all, but to be honest, she can't help others if she can't even help herself. Both Fjorm and Erica are so bad that you're better off replacing their entire kit and their weapon, but even if you made them into the best infantry lance or sword cav you could, they're still not good archetypes to run anyways. These guys are going into D tier. Next up, we have Legendary Guinevere. Some of you might know that I'm a big fan of her, and by big fan, I mean I think she sucks, and she's one of the worst units ever made in Book 7. Legendary Guinevere sucks, not only because the role she's designed for is so niche, but she also just straight up fails to do her role in the first place, or is outright useless in many situations. She can support her team by healing them 7 HP, but healing is such an irrelevant support, and if I really did want healing, I'd much rather run Gatekeeper, or really, anyone else instead. Offensively, she's designed as a mage tanker, but in an age where even the best far saves can't survive the most powerful nukes today, why am I sending out legendary Guinevere? Even if you wanted an infantry mage tank that can support, you literally have Summer Ymir or Duo Asker, both of which are better in every single way, not only because they have better survivability, but they also support the team in more ways than Guinevere ever could. Unless she gets an amazing refine in like 10 years from now, I cannot think of a single meta reason you'd willingly run her. She doesn't do a lot, and what she does do isn't even that good, and she even struggles to do her one role when there's a bajillion units out there that can turn this Queen of Burn into the Queen of England. Next up, we have Legendary Ryoma. He has Null Follow-Up, Distant Counter, IELTS Shield, True Damage and Damage Reduction, but to be honest, when you look at the amount of effects you can get from skills and supports nowadays, Ryoma sucks in basically every single way from his weapon to his preference B skill. You'd get better results by getting rid of his kit completely, but he's this high because of how useful Soaring Guidance is and him being able to run things like Guard Bearing 4. Ryoma is just lucky that he happens to be a melee flyer, one of the best archetypes in the game right now. He can't kill anything, he will die to everything, and there's nothing unique really making Ryoma good. He's not doing much, and he's most useful when he's just waiting around, warming up the bench. But at least it's accurate to Fates, because waiting around is what Ryoma does best. Finally, we have Legendary Sita. In my mind, she's just a legendary Ryoma that's blue with better BST. She has some nice things, like being effective against cavalry and armored units, she has offensive no follow-up, and she's built around using her vantage. But against the crazy broken units of today, her vantage is simply irrelevant. It doesn't matter who attacks first. If Sita is doing zero damage, and she can't kill, and she'll die in both player phase and enemy phase. I will say that I like that she comes with Kanto too, so maybe she can rally your ally and Kanto away. Not to mention, she also benefits from being a melee flyer, the best unit type you can be in arena and arguably Fey right now. But her uniqueness and overall usability is only getting worse and worse as time goes on. And other than being a glorified rally bot with Guidance 4, I don't know what else you'd be doing with her that you can't do with another melee flyer. All of these guys can sorta of contribute to your team, but Guinevere sucks as a support, and Sita and Ryoma are only here because of their archetype. Into C tier they go. Next, we have Legendary Dimitri. This guy is built like a melee initiator that debuffs multiple enemies, and while that sounds pretty great, I actually only see him getting worse and worse over time with the effects that he already got in his refine. They gave him Atrocity 2 in his remix, which sounds nice at first, but then, as some kind of twisted joke, they made Barbarity literally one month later, which is so mean when Legendary Dimitri would have much rather gotten that instead. I'm actually valuing him more as a debuffer type unit rather than a combat unit because while he's arguably good at combat now, he's only getting worse and worse as time goes on and as power creep and skill creep gets crazier. Even as a debuffer though, they keep making better ones and you might want to run someone else instead of Dimitri anyways. Even if raid bosses rise up back in the meta, being a melee infantry is the most competitive unit type to be in Fae and it's only a matter of time before he gets outclassed there too. He gets things like Phantom Speed, Damage Reduction, and DR Piercing, which sounds good because it is, but even if you assume he'd instantly delete every unit he initiates on, I'd still put him this low. To be honest, I only see him getting worse and worse. Next up, we have Legendary Leaf. This guy is a ranged cavalry unit who nullifies guard, he's got true damage, he's a brave attacker on both player phase and enemy phase, and he has a sweep effect. It's kind of weird that his refine gave him true damage even when he uses an AoE special, when you know you're never going to use him with an AoE unless you want to take away the one thing that makes him unique. 
When you look at his sweep effect, it actually only happens when the player is using Leaf, and it's crazy how this is one of, if not the only time IS thought an effect was so good that they nerfed it so it couldn't be used by the AI. But whoever did the game balancing back then must have been fired years ago because we haven't seen that condition since and we've gotten much, much worse things now for the player and the AI to use. I put him here because he's a brave attacker with a preference special that turns him into a potential gale forcer. I value his ability to act again quite a bit, not to mention him being a dual phase brave attacker means he doesn't really mind his speed stat aging. Calves are only getting better and better and he's got tons of new skills to use and enjoy. But I think he'll actually get worse over time as he's already gotten his refine and as they make better range calves and better gale forcers, you might want to run someone else. Finally, we have legendary male Byleth. This guy used to be one of the best water legendaries, best mage nukers, and best support units in the game. He comes with an amazing preference special that pierces damage reduction. He gives out drive no follow-up support, and he makes sure that fallen Edelgard is never coming back to her glory days. He did so much all at once while being the best at what he did, so it's crazy to see just how far he's fallen. In particular, he's fallen off because null follow-up has become so much more common and significantly easier to obtain. I actually think that male Byleth is a great example on how an effect can become so valuable at one point, yet become so devalued later. At the time, his drive no follow-up support was amazing because we were in a meta where NFU was mandatory just to even use your speed stat, but it was only locked to infantries, yet male Byleth was one of the few ways to get it on everyone, and he was incredibly valued for that reason. But as full no follow-up became one of the most common effects in the game through new skills, refines, or just units having it outright, his support fell off, and the worst part is that he only gives it out as a speed-based drive, which was fine at the time, but nowadays, his support might as well be non-existent, and you better hope your 4-star Alphonse can outspeed these monsters if you're trying to give him null follow-up. I actually wonder if female Alir or Camilla will one day age just like male Byleth did, when we start getting more and more skills that offer DR piercing so easily, or if it becomes significantly easier to outsource so you don't need to waste space in your skill economy. As things are right now, Byleth is just an infantry mage nuker, and he's unusually good at it with his preference special that feels like it hasn't aged a day, and since he doesn't need any of the DR piercing B skills, he's one of the few infantry mages that can also take advantage of out of combat chip damage with a cultist strike. However, we're in an age where I'd rather have nukers with more mobility, or nukers that can offer even more support, and that's why he's down here. But he might get a great refine though, so who knows how good he'll really be in the future. All of these guys are just okay water legendaries that you can still use today, but they've all shown their age, and that's why they're going into B tier. Next up, we have, uh, uh, no one. These units we've talked about are so bad that there's a visible gap between them and the rest of the monsters that roam around in water season. The rest of the water legendaries are some of the most broken units in the game, and at the bottom of S tier, we have Legendary Camilla. Because of her, out of combat chip damage has never been more stupid. Who cares about damage reduction when you can just deal insane amounts of damage before your combat even begins? One of the worst parts is that if you're trying to kill her with a ranged unit on your player phase, then you still take out of combat chip damage, which is ridiculous. And one of the worst part is that as things are right now, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And that's not even mentioning the fact that she comes with Kanto 1, because of course she does. And she also gets damage reduction, 7 HP healing, she nullifies guard, she has offensive no follow-up, and she inflicts sabotage just to push legendary male Robin even further out of the meta. And as if that still wasn't enough, she comes with one of the best support effects in the game at start of turn DR piercing to herself and the entire team. And this is giving it to anyone, regardless of your unit type. And she's also giving it to multiple people all at once. Legendary Camilla is now the best and only way to give DR piercing to more than one unit, unlike female Alir, who can only give it to her support partner. But figuring out how well Camilla will age actually depends on how IS handles both DR piercing and out of combat damage in the meta. If DR piercing becomes more and more common, which I think it will be, then her support matters less and less, and that's actually why I ranked her here. Just imagine a meta where DR piercing either becomes less relevant simply because damage reduction is less relevant, or it becomes so prevalent that Camilla's support isn't that rare anymore. I'm not saying this would definitely happen in the meta, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. DR piercing is becoming so common and so frequent that I can sort of see it becoming like the next null follow-up or Camilla aging just like male Byleth today, who both gave out an effect that used to be so good, but is now seen as less valuable because it's less rare. However, it's harder to predict exactly how out of combat chip damage would be countered in the meta, so it's tricky to say exactly how well Camilla will age, and I can see the arguments for putting her higher if the counter to out of combat chip damage never comes. I only put Camilla here because I value the units above her more in the long run, rather than Camilla herself being a bad unit. Even though it's unlikely, she still has the potential to age poorly as a support, and that's why I put her as number 4. 
Next up, we have Legendary Azura and Legendary Ninian. Legendary Azura ruled over Water Season and she was breaking the meta for a reason. And having a 3 movement dancer like Legendary Ninian makes her one of the best aging and most useful calves in the game. It's weird that there's only 2 dancer legendaries in Fey and they made them both water legendaries, but I guess Water Season is the season of preference assist skills. I'm grouping both Azura and Ninian together because I consider them side grades to each other. Azura is a flyer if you wanted flying mobility, and she also gives extra movement to your allies, null panic, and soaring guidance support as well. While Ninian is a 3 movement dancer with her cab mobility, while also being able to act again after dancing, which is incredible for action economy and things like arena and summoner duels. Having an extra attacker after dancing feels like having a 5th or 6th unit on your team, which is insane. I was going back and forth on these for a long time on who was better, but I don't think one is universally considered more useful than the other and you'd be happy with either of these two as your dancer. Between the two, I might prefer Legendary Azura because she's a dancing flyer and because she gives extra movement to infantries and flyers, meaning if one day warping becomes hard countered in the meta, she's still benefiting your team in a way that nearly no one else can. But there's many situations where you'd actually rather get an extra attacker for your action economy, not to mention that cav units are currently getting better and better in the meta. Dancers are by far one of the best units you can have in this game, because their role is to be dancing, supporting, and giving your allies another action. At the end of the day, dancers age so well because they're as good as the rest of your team when they're letting them act again. No matter how old the unit is, being able to dance is as useful today as it was on day one, and being able to do that in arena specifically has never been more useful. This is the mode where Kanto and dances are so valuable because you can't run positional assist skills if you're trying to score instead. These guys have only gotten better with Rock Slide and Firestorm Dance. There is no other Fire Emblem game where being a dancer is more useful than in Fae, where the maps are so tiny, and that's why I rank these two here. But although these two units have aged really well, there's just one other unit that seems to never die. In first place, we have one of the most stupid units ever made. A unit so good for so long that I don't understand why they made him so good. I present to you the best water legendary in the game, Legendary Krom. The king of water season has retaken his throne, and he's taken over every other mode in Fae while he's at it. To change fate is one of the most broken preference things they've ever put in this game. It makes me never want any other Krom alts ever again, and it all started with this guy. His reposition is insane in Arena, when you can't run any positional assists when you're forced to run rallies for scoring. But he's also insane in Summoner Duels, because he can still act again after he repos someone. He changed and redefined the meaning of action economy in Fae, and he's basically like a pseudo dancer that can move your allies with better kill power than every other dancer. Even if his reposition did nothing, his support would still be more than anything legendary Fjorm could possibly dream of, but then to change fate also gives him an insane level of stats that I don't know why they allowed it. In this age of support effects, he gets stronger and stronger with the more effects that he has. And the worst part is that there is absolutely no cap to the amount of stats he can have. And let's not forget that legendary male Robin reminded us all why stats are so good. It's weird that this guy ruled water season for literal years when he came out. And even at his worst, he was still good. If we ignore the two dancers, then Krom was arguably the best water legendary in the game before his refine, and yet they gave him an amazing refine to make him even better. He is so broken now to the point that you're running legendary Krom over dual Krom in summoner duels. Let that sink in. We'd rather run this guy over dual Krom, an absolute menace of a unit and one of the best duos we've ever gotten in the history of Fae. When Legendary Krom repo someone, his threat range becomes the largest in the game when he's a ranged unit that just moved 4 spaces right in front of you. He's also an infantry unit, meaning he can run the best skills in the game, and also he's effective against flying and armored units, because I guess someone at Intelligent Systems thought he just wasn't good enough without it. I have no idea why sometimes they turn out refined so bad like Legendary Edelgard, and sometimes they do stupid stuff like this. But Legendary Krom is my pick as the best water legendary, and he's definitely one of the best units in the game. These four units are legendaries that not only rule water season, but they rule multiple aspects of Fae, and they easily make up some of the best units ever made. And now that all of the water legendaries have been ranked, it's finally time to take a look at the Earth legendaries.
I would call Earth Season the weakest season with the weakest legendaries, with most of these units either being irrelevant or they've just aged really poorly. While there's some Earth legendaries that end up being very good at their peak, it feels like that's the exception rather than the rule, because otherwise, Earth Season has some of the worst legendaries in the game. Speaking of which, in last place we have Legendary Ike, one of the worst legendaries in the entire game. It's actually just sad that he's so bad when everyone can get him for free, because IS just hates making freebie units actually good. He has a super quickened pulse, a Luna that heals him, this encounter, and that's it. Infantries are quite good, but they don't have one particular thing that they excel in, and I really don't care about him when Omni tanks aren't that good, melee infantries aren't that good, sword infantries aren't that good, and most importantly, Legendary Ike is not that good. And in a meta where you'd rather have your units do multiple things at once and be amazing at it, Ike does uh, neither. I'm not that crazy about his disencounter when you have save units, meaning your far save can just handle the ranged matchups for you. But even if you wanted an Omni tank and you didn't want to run a save, Ike cannot kill anything and he will die to everything. And even as Omni tanks get better in the meta, there's no reason to run Legendary Ike over any other unit. He did get better with things like Lagoo's friend, but so did every other Omni tank in the game. Game. and assuming you even had an Emblem Ike, well just use Emblem Ike. Even Fjorm is better than this guy, and I struggle to think of things he can actually do. Ike is bad both because of better competition and because he sucks, and that's why he's the worst Earth Legendary in the entire game. Then we have Legendary Fey, a unit who is so bad that I'm genuinely shocked she came out in 2021 when she sucks as much as a refined unit who came out in 2017. Her kit is one of the worst kits I've ever seen. She inflicts guard, sometimes, she has follow-up denial, sometimes, and that's it! She has just two real effects in her weapon, one of which is nice to have at best, and the other is a contender for the worst effect in the game. At first, I was genuinely confused on why they gave her so little effects, and why she even has a condition on them when these effects borderline suck. And then I realized they probably wanted to balance the fact that she comes with life and ending, a preference miracle special, but they should have tried a little bit harder because spoiler alert, her preference special also sucks. It does pre-charge itself, meaning she's got a miracle that will heal her up back to full HP ready to go, and it sounds pretty great. That is, if you're delusional and you forgot about the fact that it only activates once per map, Fatal Smoke 4 exists, Miracle is already hard to have with all these nukers and brave attackers roaming around, and also, Fallen Maria makes everyone a better version of Faye for free, and even Maria isn't that good anymore. Even if you wanted a unit with Miracle, there's three other units in her own season that do it better than Faye, and I don't even know what she's supposed to do once her Miracle triggers, because once that happens, she cannot do anything, she will die to everything, and at this point, I'm actually impressed by how much she sucks. Infantries are already a questionable archetype, and so are dragons while we're here. But even if the day comes where you specifically wanted to run an Earth Legendary Infantry Dragon Tank with Miracle, well, I genuinely cannot think of a single reason why you'd want to run her instead. And I don't even know what else to say about her other than she sucks, and she's one of the worst Earth Legendaries in the entire game. Both Faye and Ike are not just bad, but somehow they're getting even worse, despite already being some of the worst legendaries in the entire game. I can't think of anyone more deserving of E tier than these two. Then we have Legendary Julia. Because of the sheer amount of infantries in the game, I'm already very skeptical on most of them, and it would take a lot to impress me. And Julia does not. She has dragon effectiveness, some damage reduction, a guaranteed follow-up attack, she neutralizes her penalties and her foe's bonuses, and she has close counter when she's fighting dragons. And I also don't care about her since dragons are not that good anyways, so even at her best, who cares if she's able to take out something that isn't even good? She also disables adaptive damage, but I'm not that crazy on adaptive damage in the first place, and I'm even less crazy about the thing that's supposed to stop it. And she also doesn't support the team at all, so she's a unit that is borderline dead weight that can't even help herself, never mind helping anyone else. Even if you wanted a ranged infantry, you literally have two other units in the exact same season you could run instead, one of which is also a dragon killer, and that's assuming you didn't want to run literally any other ranged infantry in the game. Some of the most powerful and most common nukers in the game are ranged infantries, meaning it becomes harder and harder to justify Legendary Julia with each new banner that comes out. The only thing saving her from E tier is the fact that she's an infantry mage, and I'd rather have an infantry mage than some of the worst melee infantries in the game, but otherwise, I really, really don't want Julia either, as she's one of the worst Earth legendaries even after her refined. Then we have Legendary Tiki, or what I like to call her, a single use of Farsafe 3 that you can't even fodder off to someone else. Legendary Tiki is not good, and she's probably one of the worst Farsafes and armors in the entire game. 
Being a far save might be one of the absolute hardest and competitive roles to fill with the sheer amount of incredibly stupid ranged nukes roaming around like crazy. Even the best far saves in the game struggle to survive against the meta, so don't even think that Tiki would do any better when she only comes with dragon effectiveness, some debuffs, distant counter and that's literally it. She only has 3 effects and that's with her refine by the way, and at this point, I struggle to think of what to even say about her. Tiki is not at all good, but at least she can take a single hit for your team before she instantly dies. And it's certainly a more meaningful contribution to the team than anything Julia can do, and that's why I put Tiki here. Even though she's one of, if not the worst far save in the game, just being a far save alone is incredibly useful in a turn-based game like Faye. It's certainly more useful than Legendary Ike at his best, and I guess it goes to show just how good save armors are in general. And since far save comes built into her preference C skill, you don't need to worry about wasting any fodder on her. That's literally the only good thing I can say about her, because otherwise, she cannot do anything. She will die to quite literally everything, and you don't want to run Tiki over any other far save in the entire game. Then we have Legendary Female Robin, yet another bad Earth Legendary with Distant Counter. Other than that, she also comes with Iot's Shield, Foe Bonus Neutralization, Guard, and that's it. I have more fingers on one hand than effects she has in her entire kit, and that's with her refine, and there's nothing to really say about Robin other than she sucks. She's a sitting duck that does nothing, she cannot kill anything, and she will die to everything. I really don't care that she comes with guard, when guard echo is an X skill now, not to mention that there's so many other units that are either running some form of tempo 4, or they can neutralize guard with their base kit completely on their own. I actually think it's kind of interesting that she comes with Iot's shield in an age where most units don't have it, but I'd rather have effects that matter in all matchups rather than just with one weapon type like bows. Although at this point, I'd rather have another unit altogether. She's only here because she's a melee flyer, meaning she can run all the skills that make flyers good and support the team with soaring guidance. I put Robin over Tiki and Julia because they value guidance support quite a bit. You'd certainly feel the impact of letting all your units warp more than a bad ranged mage at her best. And even though both saves and guidance helps your whole team, I value guidance more than saves even with the rise of Valentine's Mur. But I can see the arguments for putting Tiki above Robin or by putting them in the same spot depending on if you like save support better than guidance. And at this point, it's probably up to personal preference because it doesn't really matter when all of these units suck and you really, really don't want to run any of them. Also, I saw this and I just, I don't know what to say. All of these units are not at all good, but Julia's here because I like ranged infantries more than I like Ike. Tiki's only here because I like saves more than Julia, and Robin's only here because I like guidance more than Tiki. Into D tier they go. Then we have Legendary Deirdre. In my mind, she's just a better Legendary Julia, but a better Plastic Fork is still a Plastic Fork. As a unit, her effects are more synergistic and effective than Julia's, and that's actually why I put her here and not in D tier. She has dragon effectiveness, a guaranteed follow-up attack, she disables adaptive damage, and she inflicts some penalties, but the main thing making her unique is her preference special, a 2 cooldown miracle that also boosts her special damage when it activates. It does sound pretty great at first, but even though I like this way better than Faye's preference special, everything I said about Miracle with Legendary Faye still applies here, and it's not enough to warrant using Legendary Deirdre over basically any good infantry mage in the game. I don't really care about her Miracle when infantry mages aren't usually the type to live things anyway, and even if you wanted to abuse it, you just can't when she doesn't have any way to loop it because she has no healing, and how it will only trigger once per map. The best infantry mages are able to nuke things, provide insane support, or ideally do both, and Deirdre does neither. I'm also not that fond of her ability to disable adaptive damage, and you'd think I would praise her for countering an effect that's becoming more common and prevalent through Hexblade and other support effects, but I'm not that crazy about Hexblade as a whole, and I don't think it's something that breaks the meta. It's certainly not a bad effect, but units that are designed to be bad on their enemy phase will die no matter whether you attack their defense or res, and the only matchups Hexblade might actually make a difference would be against tanks, except it doesn't, because most tanks nowadays have similar amounts of defense and res. Not to mention that they keep splitting off the tier 4 skills into just defense or res versions, which is anti-synergistic in the situations where Hexblade would actually matter. I only put her this high due to her miracle, but to be honest, I almost put her in the same tier as Julia at first. Although in the end, I think there's a point where a unit like Deirdre is good enough to warrant a team slot relative to the rest of the garbage in Earth Season, and you get more value from an offensive unit like her rather than a one-time use of far save or guidance, and that also applies to every unit above her too. But it's also hard to justify using her over any other unit in Earth Season above her, and that's why I put Deirdre here. Then we have Legendary Alm. Even though he's this high, I actually don't really like him that much either. 
I'm not that fond of him because I'm already not that crazy about infantries, and GR piercing has never been more common, meaning he's really not that unique at all. He gets true damage even with AoEs, he neutralizes guard, and assuming his foe uses physical damage, if he outspeeds them by 5, then he gets a sweep effect, but his speed stat is not that good, especially not after the speed creep jump in book 7. So it's like the sweep effect isn't even there, and Alm's only other saving grace is his preference special, a 2 cooldown deadeye that has extra damage and most importantly, fully pierces damage reduction. I can see why this guy used to be one of the best ranged infantries, especially after his refine. In an age where DR piercing wasn't really a thing, it's clear this guy would obliterate anything in his way. But nowadays, DR piercing is so incredibly common that you can basically expect it on any unit that's even somewhat good. Nukes are so powerful to the point where you just need to assume that almost every unit will take out any unit they initiate on. So every new day that passes is a day where Alm becomes less and less unique, and he also doesn't support the team at all, so he really has no other redeeming qualities other than being a ranged nuke. For the same reasons I put Deirdre over everyone else in D and E tier, I put Alm over them because even though he's only getting worse and worse, I don't think his offenses are so bad that I'd rather have Robin or Tiki. Even though he's getting outclassed as a ranged nuke, his offenses and DR piercing is the only thing that saved him from D tier, and that's actually also why I put him over Deirdre, but I was debating between the two of them for a long time, and I wouldn't disagree with any arguments for putting Deirdre over Alm. As units, both Alm and even Deirdre are much better than Julia, but to be honest, I really don't want Alm either, and that's why I put him here. Then we have Legendary Claude. This guy used to be a monster, and he was so good because of how crazy his kit was, especially given what the game looked like back in Book 5. But nowadays, it's almost sad to see how this star has fallen. He has full null follow-up and he inflicts splash gravity to his enemy and foes within one space. But the thing that made him so insane was his preference B skill, which gave him 80% DR when he initiates, then 80% DR in his first combat in player phase, then it gave him 80% DR in his first combat in enemy phase. 80% is a lot of percent, and it was so good in an age where we didn't have a lot of DR piercing, or even damage reduction in the first place. But I've already talked about how incredibly common DR piercing is nowadays, not to mention that even ignoring that, his DR only works works against the foe's first attack in his first combat per phase, which actually isn't that often, and brave attackers simply don't care about it, which sucks for Claude when brave attackers have never been more common. And other than his damage reduction and splash gravity, he doesn't really have anything worthwhile in his kit. He's still a flyer, and like I said with legendary female Robin, even the worst flyer is better than Ike. In an age where flyers have never been better, I like Claude the most out of everyone we've talked about so far, and he's definitely the unit with the most meaningful contribution to the team. Similarly to why I put Robin over Julia, I put Claude over Alm and Deirdre because I'd rather have a bad unit with Guidance instead. For as long as the unit's alive, flyers can support and benefit the team in such an incredible way. Whereas at best, a decent ranged infantry is only pulling their own weight, and at worst, the moment they can't take out an enemy, they become outright useless. Even though Claude's still useful, he's really just a guidance spot and there's no reason to run him over any other flyer. And while I'm curious to see how good he'll be with his future refine, for now, I really don't want him either, and that's why I put him here. Deirdre and Alm are far from the worst ranged infantries, and Claude is a flyer that isn't as bad as female Robin. While all these legendaries are not good, at least it's something, and that's why they're going into C tier. Then we have legendary Nana. While I'm not that fond of Cavs in Arena, she used to be the best Earth Legendary in the game, and if you look at her kit, you can definitely see why. She's one of the most unique units in the game when she comes with Kanto remaining plus one, true damage, desperation, offensive null follow-up, 7 HP healing, DR piercing in the weapon, and most importantly, she's one of the few units in the game that completely disables defensive specials, meaning she just doesn't care about specials like godlike reflexes, Aegis, Pavis, or even Miracle, just in case a certain Earth Legendary wasn't bad enough. It's also interesting that she came with DR piercing so early on in Book 6, when we didn't get most of our DR piercing things until Book 7, and it's no surprise why she used to be a good unit. And I also like that she comes with Desperation, although her speed stat isn't the greatest, so you might not always get a chance to use it anyways. And as time goes on, not only has Nana become outclassed, but even her niche in stopping defensive specials have been made irrelevant. She's outclassed in her role in what is essentially being a player phase nuke. Even though she accomplishes it in a unique way, at the end of the day, she's just a player phase cav nuker. And in that sense, she's actually not unique at all. She's the type of unit that looks and sounds amazing in theory, but in practice, I'm not really sure if I'd want to run her. And at this point, I'd rather just run Spring Carla instead, who can do the same thing as Nana but better. And yet even Carla isn't the best melee cav nuker anymore. She's certainly not bad, but calves in general are one of the most common archetypes in the game. She has so much competition, and she also doesn't support the team at all. And I only see her getting worse and worse as we get better player phase calves, and that's why I put her here. 
Then we have Legendary Seleth. He was definitely one of the worst legendaries in the entire game before his refine, so it's impressive to see him this high. He's designed as an enemy phase calf, which is just a poor design to be in since calves as an archetype are really bad defensively. But Seleth got a refine so good, maybe the best refine in the entire game, with so many effects that it feels like he got two refines at once. And now, he's the gold standard of what you're hoping the refine looks like for your favorites. He has true damage, a guaranteed follow-up attack, up to 80% damage reduction, follow-up denial, 8 HP healing, enemy phase brave and most importantly, a miracle built right into his weapon that isn't limited to activating just once per map. And his kit is really synergistic too, since the healing helps him loop his miracle. And he also has Null C Disrupt, one of if not the most valuable and rare effects an Omni Tank wants to have, especially with the prominence of Duo Leon. While he was definitely a top tier unit at the peak of his refine, Omni Tanks are such a competitive archetype to be in, and we've reached the point where even Seleth has been outclassed there too. He's still a great Omni Tank and he's the best enemy phase cav in the game, but he's not the best Omni Tank and I don't even think he's the best cav Omni Tank. At first, I almost put him under Nana, and it depends on what you value more. Considering they're both outclassed in their given role, where you put them will depend on if you like an offensive cav more or a defensive one. In the end, I like Seleth more because Nana's kit is just a roundabout way of turning her into a player face cav nuker. Whereas even though they've already made better Omni tanks today, I like Stella for his unique combo of Null C and Miracle Looping. Although to be honest, at that point, I'd rather run this other Earth Legendary instead. And his name is Legendary Male Allier. In my mind, if you wanted an Earth Legendary who's an Omni Tank, look no further than this guy. Not only is he a colorless infantry, basically the best unit type you could ask for from an Omni Tank, but he has DR Piercing, Scowl, and the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase, unlike Legendary Seleth, who only gets it in his enemy phase. And he has a Preference A skill, a distant counter that gives him 40% damage reduction even on brave hits, and a one-time use of Miracle that will heal him back to full HP. I don't know why there's so many Earth Legendaries with Miracle, but weirdly enough, I actually don't really like Alir's A skill. Firstly, it gives him Distant Counter, which is nice, but I don't love it when he already had the privilege of using the Distant Counter Dragon Seal. And just imagine how much cooler it would have been if he had a much better effect there instead. Then, he can't loop his Miracle since the A skill only triggers once per map. Not to mention that he requires at least 3 allies to be near him for it to activate, meaning it's outright useless in any situation where you take out his allies first. While it's thematically cool and it will trigger as long as Alir has more than 1 HP, it ends up being weirdly more strict than even Legendary Seleph's Miracle, which itself is a weirdly more strict version of Brave Seleph's Miracle. And speaking of things that are thematically cool that I don't like, I actually hate it when engaged units have the condition where they want allies from distinct game titles. Male Alir has a stat swing when his teammates are from different games, but even though it's super easy to hit, it's just a restriction on stats when nearly every other unit doesn't have such a restriction. And it also either indirectly nerfs every other engaged unit that comes out if you wanted to use Male Alir, or it indirectly nerfs him the moment they make an engaged unit that's really worth using. While I love it thematically and it makes for interesting and creative game design, from a meta standpoint, it just sucks. He's definitely a better Omni Tank than Seleph is, and I just don't think Nana contributes to the team more than Alir, both offensively and defensively. But he also doesn't support the team at all, so I really only see him getting worse and worse as they've already made an arguably better Omni Tank than him a month after he came out, and they will continue to do so in the future. I can't really recommend him as I only see him aging really poorly as time goes on, and that's why I put him here. Nana, Seleph, and Alir are good, but they're only getting worse over time and I can see them dropping into C tier in the future. But for now, they make their way into B tier. Next, we have literally nobody, because none of these Earth Legendaries are good enough to be put in A tier and I'm constantly reminded that Earth Legendaries suck. Finally, we're looking at the only Earth Legendary in the game that I would think about using. This unit is not only one of the most cancerous units in the entire game, but he's a unit so good that even IS didn't know how to counter it. At the top of S tier, we have Legendary Male Robin. In my mind, he's living proof that IS doesn't understand how to balance their own game. This guy is not only one of the most broken units released in all of Book 7, but he's one of the most meta-impactful units they've ever made. On paper, he actually looks pretty underwhelming. He really only comes with stats and unity, so it makes sense why everyone underrated the dude on his release. But his ability to inflict exactly what he needs on himself is what turns him from good to so insanely stupid. Unity isn't a new effect. We've seen it on A skills and on entire characters like Fall 
Paul and Ike. But what makes Legendary Male Robin so broken is that unlike everyone else, he not only gives himself two sources of unity that stacks, since Grand Strategy is just another way to get unity, but he's incredibly self-sufficient because he also inflicts debuffs on yourself, whereas everyone else in the game is reliant on their opponent to activate unity. And also, it's just such poor game design, because every game on the planet, including Faye, is designed to give you ways to remove buffs on your opponent. Like, obviously, that makes sense. But why am I wanting to remove the penalties of my opponent? Like, why would they design a unit like this? Unlike some units that look pretty good in theory, but are just okay in practice, this guy looks just okay in theory and is so absurdly stupid in practice. And to this day, even IS is terrified of Legendary Male Robin, because they chose to invent a whole new effect to give to Brave Robin instead of giving him Grand Strategy. And even now, not a single character in the game has had Grand Strategy after Legendary Male Robin, as IS has never, ever touched Grand Strategy ever again. Legendary Male Robin is such backwards game design that IS had to try multiple times to counter him, with things like Sabotage, Ploy, and Snaki. And despite how crazy he used to be, he's actually fallen off quite a bit. As a unit, even though his stats are crazy high, he actually struggles a lot offensively. And even ignoring Ploy and Sanaki, there are a lot of other things we'd rather run nowadays instead of Robin, not to mention the prevalence of pre-combat damage. At first, I almost put him in A tier instead of S tier because I only see him getting worse and worse, and it's for that reason why I think all Earth legendaries suck and why Earth Season is the weakest season. I'm not sure if I can recommend him when I don't see any specific reason he would get any better. But if you had to summon for any Earth Legendaries, this is the only one I'd want in case the day comes where it's safe to have debuffs again. In the end, I felt Robin deserved a spot in S tier, not only because he's still pretty good, but also because every other Earth Legendary is so insanely bad. His support will always be somewhat beneficial, assuming the enemy doesn't have ploy. He's aged unusually well for a unit IS tried to nerf over and over again, and when he's one of the best supports they've ever made in the history of Fae, it's no surprise that Legendary Male Robin is the best Earth Legendary in the entire game. Robin is a unit so good that even IS doesn't want to touch his effect ever again. He provides support like no other legendary or unit in the game, and it's no surprise he stands alone in S tier. Not only is he the best Earth legendary you could have, but he's the best aging Earth legendary in the entire season. And there we have it. It's been a long ride, but every single legendary in Fire Emblem Heroes has been ranked. Legendaries are probably one of my most favorite unit types in the game. They're some of the most powerful and meta-impactful units in Fae. They get an entire trailer dedicated to them, and they're also some of the rarest and hardest units in the game to get. Although, to be honest, power creep moves too fast for you to actually care about the meta, and I'll always say that the only legendaries actually worth summoning for are the ones that bring you the most joy. And so the actual best legendaries in each season are always going to be your favorites. I had a lot of hot takes in this one, so I'd love to know what you agreed or disagreed with in the comments below. Did you like the video? Only if you did, feel free to give this video a like or become a member down below. It really does make a difference. Take care until we talk again, and I'll see you soon in the next one.